So I will confess that I am so old that I predate the internet, or at least uh, the, the popularized version of the internet that we know. And I remember the start of kind of viral videos. That was a, a thing that I very much remember as I was an adult when it happened. And one of the first ones I recall is, is this one you may be familiar with. It's the double rainbow guy, right? That the guy, it never appears on camera. He's just talking about this double rainbow all the way across the sky, man. What does it mean? What does it mean? So is this, you know, this wonderful gentleman uh, here, it's uh, the, the double rainbow guy. And, and I just remember that for a couple of different reasons. It was so significant. I think uh, for him and uh, for to see this, um, I remember it because first of all, it was a viral video and I was like, man, this thing is, it's crazy how we're all connected like this and all seeing this and all seeing it differently. But how he was seeing those rainbows differently too struck me that, that he had a different perception of those things um, than I did. And so his question, you know, what does it mean? Oh my God, what does it mean? Right? That's what he kept asking. And that really has stuck with me over the years and and very much so on my mind when I think about sociological analysis, which is the critical framework of of uh, of critical media studies that we're going to be looking at in this video and in this lesson. So um, so let's just jump in. What is sociological analysis? Sociological analysis examines the recurrent patterns in media, how those patterns influence the interactions of people, and how an audience assigns meaning to symbols used in an artifact. Just like that guy assigned meaning or tried to, was trying to figure out the meaning. What was the meaning of those double rainbows? And it made me think, what would my reaction be if I saw double rainbows? Or something? So, uh, so how does an audience assign meaning to the symbols that are used in that artifact? Then? So the origins of sociological analysis really lie in um, uh, symbolic interactionism. It's called symbolic interactionism, which is just um, the character and conduct of people's social interactions are influenced by the symbolic meanings they assign to objects, events, other people, and social context. Okay, so, um, yeah, how we how we relate to and interact with with the world around us is very um, specific. It, it is it's it is relative and it is personal. So it is different for every person, and it is deeply personal based on our frame of reference, based on our uh, our experiences and our knowledge and our our views on the world, our beliefs, our attitudes, our values, all those types of things that go into our frame of reference. So meaning. According to symbolic interactionism, meaning is relative and personal, but it's also built via social constructs. So we assign meaning uh, in part based on the way that, that we see these things relating to our society and how we're told in our culture that this is good and this is bad or you know, how we should kind of think about this. That, that influences for sure. If, even if it doesn't totally overwhelm, it definitely influences our views on these things. So while, while our, the meaning remains relative and personal, it's also influenced and built via social constructs, right? And meaning is interpreted. It's, it, you know, it's not specifically defined. It's, it's based on the interpretation of that person, right? Of that individual. So yeah, you see in the, in the, in the cartoon here, one person sees a boat and gets excited. One person sees the land and gets excited about different things. So their meaning is interpreted. What does it mean that they see these things? What does it mean that they say these things? And, and uh, why are they so excited about something so simple and so opposite? And uh, because it's interpreted, because it's deeply personal and relative, um, because it's built via social constructs and because that meaning is interpreted. So we can apply it just a, a little bit or explain it a little bit here further. Social interactionism is, is sort of a process that starts with a symbol, um, whatever that symbol is, whether it's a word, whether it's an image, whether it's, you know, a, a, a behavior, whatever it is that, that that is symbolic that somebody's trying to use to communicate. So there's that symbol it starts with a symbol. Then we develop that individual meaning. When I see the symbol, what does that mean to me specifically? Right? What does it mean to me individually as I am experiencing this symbol? Uh, then we have to factor in social influence, though. Right? So not just what does it mean to me, but what does it mean to society? And, and uh, do I um, fit in with what society says about this symbol and, and what I should believe? Or, or am I um, you know, resistant to that? Am I rejecting that and going a different direction? Uh, and then, of course, there's always this evolving interpretation. Though. So we interpret things, but that can change over time. We change as we as we age and as we experience new things and learn new things. Um, then our then our beliefs and our attitudes and our values may change along with that. And then, of course, 
because of that, how we uh, view and engage with a symbol will change and that, that will be constantly evolving as well. So if we can apply this uh, specifically just for a second to give you a demonstration of, of social interaction or symbolic interactionism, um, we, could, we could look first at the symbol and we'll just take the symbol of the Confederate flag. That's one that's been in discussion for a long time now. And so one that we're hopefully all aware of and can relate to. So that symbol is just the, the, the Confederate flag, right? Now, the flag itself is just, in this instance, a piece of fabric uh, with a specific design on it, with specific colors, right? But it's just, it's just a thing. Right? But it is a symbol. It represents um, a specific... Uh, depending on your view, and we'll get into that, it represents a specific ideology or a specific uh, geographic area or a specific point in history or or different things like that can, could, could um, you know, do that. So but when we see it, then we have this individual interpretation. So for some people, it's just a symbol of independence, of, uh, of uh, you know, personal freedom and personal independence and, and standing up for what you believe in, or it's, it may... Uh, um, be the the culture of the south so to speak so but whatever you, when you see that flag you're going to have a specific interpretation for you individually what is it that you think of when you see that flag or what does it represent to you individually then we're going to also going to fold in all these social constructs right like this idea that from generation to generation it's passed down what it means whether that meaning is that it's that it's pure evil and it's hatred and it's it, it represents division and and oppression or if it just represents you know, for some people, they would say it just represents the cultures of the South. It doesn't have any connection anymore to the Civil War or, you know, that kind of stuff. It really just represents the the ideals or the philosophies that are important to people who live in the southern part of the United States. And that's all it's intended to represent, so, uh, according to them. So, but, but we get these social constructs where we're told this is what it represents or this is what it means. And so, um, you know, so we start with our individual idea and then we come come up against these social constructs that either confirm or or work against our individual thing, and then we're influenced by that okay? so then in the end we have this evolving interpretation though it may be that when you're younger when you're a child and you learn these things you know if you learned for example um, that, that the confederate flag is just about um southern culture but then as you get older, maybe you come to learn some of the history of, you know, the, the Confederacy and the Civil War and the, the oppression of, uh, of minorities and, and specifically of African-Americans during that time and, uh, and, and, and before that, of course. But, uh, but that, it, you know, that it is connected for many people to that. And you may start to have conflicted feelings about that. Maybe you had a positive feeling about it but over time you start to see that it's that while you still think it, it represents some good things for other people maybe it doesn't maybe i shouldn't hang it out maybe i shouldn't wear wear it on my shirt or whatever and so your your interpretation may evolve over time or perhaps the opposite direction maybe you grew up thinking it's it's just really evil and it's wrong and over time you maybe start to to see or believe that it's, it's really just a, a piece of fabric and it's not the flag itself but it's the you know the way that people interpret it and the way that people use it and things like that, that's really evil. So maybe you soften up on it a little bit and start to admire it as a piece of art. I don't know. But the point is your interpretation may evolve over time, may change over time on that. Yeah. And that's totally normal. That's symbolic interactionism, right? That's, that's when we see these symbols, then we have these individual interpretations, but it's then we factor in the, 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 the social influence, right? The influence of society, and then that leads to our uh, interpretation constantly evolving. Right? And then the cycles back through around again. And we keep doing this, doing it over again, right? We may have a different interpretation and start all over next time we see it. So uh, the sociological analysis is really grounded in that symbolic interactionism, that connection that we all have to seeing different symbols and interpreting them uh, individually, but also having that shared connection through the social construct, which causes us to... to then um, uh, change our interpretation possibly over time, incrementally or or all at once. It depends on the on the moment. Okay, the major premises of um, uh, sociological analysis that I really want to talk about uh, now that we have an understanding of where it came from are uh, first dramaturgy, right? Dramaturgy um, is this um, uh, since that well, well, dramaturgy essentially has to do with impression management. For our, for our purposes, we're going to call it impression management. And uh, so 
for critical analysis specifically, it's this idea that media convey, though, the ideal framework for social identity, right? So we were talking about how we have our individual interpretations, but then it's affected by, you know, our society and things. Well, where do we get most of those influences? We get them from the people around us, our loved ones, right? But we also get a lot of this understanding from the media. So media convey what is um, based on our culture supposed to be the ideal framework of social identity. Uh, in other words, they tell us who we should, media tells us who we should want to be. Uh, maybe not who we are, but who we should want to be or how we should think about these things. So, um, so this is the essence of dramaturgy, that it's about impression management and the um, idea that, that people want to to fit in, in essence, you know, so in the, in the end that people want to fit in, we want to be part of a, a culture and part of a society. So dramaturgy works on that. Uh, Shakespeare once said, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. So dramaturgy essentially says that, that, that we are all players in this stage in the stage of life. So we're all constantly managing our, uh, ourselves our, our, in, the, in the presence that we put out, our, our, um, our identity. We're managing that in the public and for ourselves. And uh, so all the world really is a stage and we're, we're essentially putting on a play in many ways. And so we may have, though, as, as Shakespeare points out, many parts. Uh, I can tell you for sure that the person I was when I was in my teens and then in my 20s and even in my 30s and is not the person that I am now in my late 40s. Right? We'll call it late 40s. Um, that, that That's different now. I am a different person. So I have had many lives, to be honest. And uh, so, uh, but so we um, manage all of that and our identity uh, in part through dramaturgy that is affected by the media then and influenced by that. So um, dramaturgy has basically these components. I'm not going to get into detail on a lot of these, but, um, but it says we have a stage. In, essence, in, in other words, where is this happening? We have the setting. What is the context? What what am I wearing? What are the the uh, the pieces around me? Think of yourself on a, on a stage if you're performing a play, right? Well, the setting or the stage is the stage itself. That's where it's happening. The setting then is all those little things, all the the set decorations and the the props that you have, and so the things that we use to establish our identity and to communicate our identity and communicate an idea. Uh, that's setting. All the all the different props and and things that we might use to do that. Um, part, what is the part that you're playing, right? What is your role? What is your role as an individual, as uh, in your workplace? What role do you play there? Not just your job itself, but, but who are you amongst your coworkers? Are you the joker? Are you the dependable one? Are you the whatever? We all have a part. It's easy to see in family settings too, right? So the oldest child is the responsible one, right? The oldest child is the responsible one and the youngest is the irresponsible one and the one who's been babied all their life, right? And the middle child is the forgotten one and, the, you know, all these things. We all have these parts that we play them throughout our lives. We, we, they really influence how we behave and we have some choice in that, right? We kind of decide this is who I want to be. And so we try and pursue that then. Now, the problem is if we're trying to pursue, you want to be the joker and uh, you're not very funny, then that's a problem. You know, that's going to be that's going to be hard for you to, to play that part, but we, we can attempt it. But we all have these parts that we're going to play throughout our lives. And we're going to support that through um, impression management and, and trying to convey a particular identity with people. And then team has to do with um, how do those around us react to that? Again, if I'm trying to be the joker in the office, I need some people around me to laugh at that, right? And to tell me that I'm funny and to tell other people that I'm funny and that, you know, when somebody else gets hired, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, he's the, he's the, he's the funny guy in the office. When you need to laugh, you go to him or whatever, but, or whatever it is, we need those people around us to support that. And if not, they're going to um, uh, reject that. And eventually we're going to have to change the part that we're pursuing because uh, it's just not going to work if we don't have that team around us supporting it. So dramaturgy involves all these different elements and media conveys, again, who we should want to be in that sense, right? What part should we want to play is desirable. And how do we go about doing that? We can see that represented in the media as well. So they kind of idealize this idea of who we should want to be. 
Uh, and all that goes in. Yeah, I get, so media goes in there and uh, and we get influenced by that. Um, that's not to say media is totally to blame. I mean, we are thinking, um, you know, capable individuals that can take that information and do what we will with it. But there's no doubt, no question that media certainly is a large influence in the establishment of this uh, dramaturgy. Another major premise of uh, sociological analysis are, in, you know, one of the things that, that we look at a lot in sociological analysis is called frame analysis. So we're going to take a look at that. Uh, and this is just the idea that the media frames things. I mean, they, they media, all media has to make choices about what they're going to say, how they're going to say it, um, you know, what symbols are going to use. Uh, to, to represent that idea and to convey their ideas. So, um, so, uh, so we, we look at frame analysis as part of this as well. So, uh, the reality is anytime we come up against an artifact or see an artifact, there's this personal reality, which is for us, um, the experiences that we have, the culture, uh, the beliefs and attitude, belief, attitude, and value system that we have. So it's essentially, again, our frame of reference. It's everything that makes us who we are. And that's our personal reality for us as individuals, as the audience. Then we also have the media frames the me and the media frames different things. Um, they make choices. They have selection on what they're going to include and not include. Right. A newscast is only so long. They can't include, they can't talk about everything. So they make choices about what they're going to talk about. They make a point of emphasis on different things. What goes first? What goes later? What, what's going to, um, uh, take priority and what are they going to emphasize and spend time on and put in front of us? Again, um, when we think about agenda setting, um, that the media doesn't tell us what to think, but they tell us what to think about by those choices that they make and what they emphasize and what they express is important to us. And then how are they going to present it? How are they going to present it? We're going to talk about that uh, in just a second and we'll put this in context, but all of that then goes into the individual frame. So it's not just the personal reality and it's not just the media frames it's the combination of those things and the confluence of those things where they come together and and how they intersect and then the end result you throw all that in a blender and out comes your individual frame that's the idea that's the essence of frame analysis uh, so just looking at it in a, um, a specific context, it, right now, as I'm recording this video, there are two um, kind of large scale conflicts happening in the world. There's the uh, war in Ukraine that's been going on for a while now between, you know, after the Russian invasion, uh, invasion of Ukraine. So they're still um, fighting in Ukraine, very much so. And, uh, and the, there's conflict uh, presently in the Gaza Strip. Um, area following uh, an October attack uh, in this year on Israel. So Israel is currently uh, occupying uh, Gaza and trying to, um, to, you know, to, to, to uh, exterminate, I guess it would be the right word, Hamas. And so there's, I mean, there's serious armed conflicts going on in two parts of the world. And um, so um, you may have some connection there. Your experiences, your culture, your beliefs, attitudes, and values will tell you kind of, you know, how do I feel about this? How do, what do I think about this? Do I think the, uh, the, the war in, in, um, uh, Gaza and that, that Israel uh, invading there is just, is it a just retaliation? Uh, do I think that the United States should be supporting these? If I don't have any personal connection, I still do because as an American citizen, we are, our government is supporting these things and, and sending money. So how do I feel about that? Um, not even just the wars themselves, but the, the, how do I feel about the U S involvement and what level we should be involved in all those types of things. You can have different feelings on each of these. I mean, we all will have different and distinct feelings about each of these based on our own frame of reference. So that will be very individual for us right? very personal. Um, but we also are getting information from some place, right? And, and a lot of times, in, you know, whether it's MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, whatever, or if it's, you know, something totally different, if you, if you get your news just from social media or just from the late night TV shows or from the BBC or something, you know, international like that. We're all getting our information from somewhere. And those folks, though, are also working on this, on, on the, you know, as all media do, selection, emphasis, and presentation. They're selecting which stories they're going to talk about and which ones they're not. Uh, they're selecting how much they're going to emphasize these different things uh, and how they're going to present them and what spin they're going to put on it. So, for example, um, right now, uh, while everybody's covering uh, Israel and Gaza, they're all talking about it differently. 
Okay, so they're presenting it in different ways and uh, and looking at different aspects of it. And some of the news channels have really kind of moved off of the Ukrainian war at this point. It's been going on for a while. It's not really in the public, uh, the forefront of the public mind at this point. Um, but CNN has chosen to really stick with it. I'll give them that when, I, when I'm, uh, you know, surveying the different channels. I do see that CNN has really maintained a... a a priority uh, for for um, the Ukrainian war, and uh, so um, they're still covering it. I would say more than the other um, major news channels are, for example. So they've made a choice in terms of selection and emphasis and presentation to continue to have that in the in the forefront. Um, so, but they all make those choices right, for both these things, and then from that we get our individual frame based on what our own personal ideals are and connections are with that. And then where and how we're getting our information that all gets thrown in the blender. Again, it comes out with the, with the, how we feel about it individually. Now, when we look at this though, um, again, thinking about selection and emphasis and presentation, I've been relating it to these two wars, but the fact is, you know, uh, there all these uh, places are also covering, President Trump's trials, the many trials, legal issues of President Trump, all the indictments and things. So they're talking about that. And I would say Fox and MSNBC are emphasizing that or prioritizing that to a greater extent um, than the other things that are happening. I think CNN is doing more to balance those things, if that makes any sense. And that's not a that's not an endorsement of CNN in any way. It's just an observation from my perspective on surveying these channels. That CNN, had, they cover the trials, but they also have maintained, as I said, keeping Ukrainian war in the forefront and also covering Israel's um, invasion of, of Gaza. Right. So um, there's all these things that are happening. And, uh, and and so they have to make choices about where they're going and essentially where their audience wants them to be. Right. That's what it comes down to. So, but we need to understand that and, and recognize how that influences then what we're getting and how we're perceiving um, these different events. And so um, those are important things for us to consider sociologically as we think about um, how we're getting our information. And, you know, again, they're not telling us necessarily what to think, although some of them are sometimes telling us what to think, but, uh, but they definitely are telling us what to think about and giving us um, information on what to think about. Right? So, um, but, and how does that affect us as a society and, and how we all, what information do we all have? And are we all reading from the same playbook, in essence? So I hope this gives you some understanding of sociological analysis and some uh, foundation for that, um, for, 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 for looking at, at things in that view, just to think about how we perceive things as a society, how we understand things as a group, how that impacts how we present ourselves, our impression management, and how we engage in dramaturgy, media influences that. Uh, but also understanding um, frame analysis and the impact of media on that. Again, that's not to place all responsibility on the media. We certainly have free will. We certainly have the ability to think for ourselves and to understand these things. And that's kind of what we're doing here with critical media studies. If you have questions about sociological analysis or any other of the critical lenses that we're looking at as part of this series, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that this will give you some new um, critical um, perspective as we encounter media and we do so with a, with a, a mind towards understanding um, who we are as individuals, who we are as a society, and how media impacts and influences all of that.